So the question really was, um, is Brexit worth it? Which I suspect most people in this room have a pretty strong answer on, but we'll pretend that you don't and make the case anyway. Um, I, I'm going to try and do it in a, I, I think there was only really one argument that really, um, really worked, to be honest, during the, during the referendum. And it is one that I find quite convincing myself. I don't think that it is without value or without virtue. And that is really the sovereignty argument. Now, this has been quite disparaged, I think. It's disparaged, but probably we don't agree with it. Um, and it was disparaged in the run-up to the referendum, but not after the referendum, by most people in Westminster. Because the idea of sovereignty sounds a little bit academic, because it sounds a bit posh, it was thought that it wouldn't connect with people. But in actual fact, the phrase take back control did connect with people. And it is not unreasonable for people to wish to have control over their community, control over their work, control over their economy. When we answer that kind of question, you're ultimately answering a philosophical issue. I'm about to spend some of the time talking about some of the most unspeakable technical jargon you could possibly come up with and try to explain it. There's no windows here, so you can't escape. You're basically trapped. But at the root of all of that stuff is a kind of a philosophical question which is how much do you cooperate with someone for mutual gain, for mutual advantage? And you make that, you make that judgment at work, you make it at home. And when someone comes to live with you in your home, whether it's a partner or a friend, you think, well, we can team up on certain stuff, whether it's you know, emotional reassurance, which may or may not be there after a few years, or whether it's you know, paying the bills together. And in exchange, you might not get to watch what you want to watch on TV every single night. That idea of giving things up for mutual advantage is a core part of your life. And it is at the heart of almost every economic choice that we make with the European Union and in terms of world trade. So let me try and explain it now. Let me try and explain why I think even someone like me was quite critical of the way in which very often decisions are sucked up in the EU to the highest level rather than the lowest level. It actually is a pretty good proposition, a pretty strong proposition. Now for me to do that, I now need to spend about five minutes talking about the way that world trade works, and I apologise in advance, and I will apologise again at the end. Hopefully by the end of it you'll have a pretty clear grasp of how this functions and you'll be able to use these arguments yourselves. Um, one of the obstacles to trade used to be, and has been historically, tariffs. Tariffs is, I think, a really unhelpful word, and I try to avoid it wherever possible. The best thing to talk about is just to talk about taxes on stuff that you're selling into a country. It is no more or less complicated than that. The reason that we have these taxes is simply to protect the guys that produce things at home. So if right now you take British Sugar, now British Sugar has good working class jobs. They work mostly with beet, in fact exclusively with beet, which is domestically produced, unlike Tate and Lyon, which produces mostly with sugarcane, legacy of colonialism comes from outside the UK. Now British Sugar maintains good quality British working class jobs, about 35 grand, 40 grand, manufacturing, essentially agricultural manufacturing taking place in the UK, the kind of thing that we might want to preserve. If you had no tariffs on sugar, on agricultural goods to the rest of the world, the first thing that would happen is that countries which tend to subsidise their sugar, countries like Thailand and Brazil, would flood the British market with cheap sugar. Now that is not the free market operating. That is subsidies by foreign governments towards industries that they want to support. When that sugar came in, unless there were protections for British sugar producers, British sugar would go bust. That is the consequence of how that would work. That is one of the reasons that we have tariffs. The solution to the tariff problem is to club together, is to basically form a customs union. Because tariffs in the end don't really help people. There are instances where they can, but ultimately where you want to go to is reducing them just very, very cautiously, very, very carefully, making sure that your domestic producers are protected against the winds of globalisation. So you set up something called the Customs Union within the EU. And this does two things, only two. First of all, it creates one tariff all the way around your territory. So that if, it, so that if the US sends an orange to Italy, it pays 10%, say it's not really 10%, I have no idea what it is. Um, and if it sends that orange to Germany, it also pays 10%. That's how a customs union operates. In exchange for that, you eradicate tariffs on the inside of the customs union. So if Germany sends the orange to Italy, it pays nothing, and vice versa. This is actually a pretty effective mechanism. One of the things that it does is it means that in trade talks, you have a lot more heft. 
you have a lot more might, you have half a billion quite wealthy consumers that you can use to leverage an advantage in a trade talk. Um, it also has a downside, which is that you can't negotiate your own trade deals. You may have heard that a few Brexit people find this quite irritating and go on about it on a daily basis. The reason for that is because you, you can't really reduce your tariffs, or at least your tariffs are controlled by your colleagues. So for a country like Britain, which in any trade deal is going to try to take in agricultural and manufacturing goods in exchange for trying to secure some kind of penetration for its financial services, it has very, very little to offer in order to secure something that no country has ever secured, really, which is financial services penetration through a financial uh, through a trade agreement. That is the solution, or some part of the solution, to tariffs. But tariffs haven't really been a problem for world trade for a very, very long time. The main problem that we have is, or at least the main solution that we have, is regulation. Most Brexit commentators tend to act as if trade is in the same place that it was when Gladstone was in power. And in fact, predominantly that is their dominant theory of international relations. It's mostly done by diplomacy, and that explains some of the psychological frustration they feel when it doesn't work. In actual fact, we've moved past tariffs and we did it quite a long time ago. Our way of trying to make sure that goods can flow freely is through sharing regulation. Now, that word regulation has been considered for a very long time by Eurosceptic people, on, typically on the right, typically conservatives, to be a barrier to trade. In fact, regulation is a facilitator of trade. Because the second that you decide you're going to do something with a product, let's say that you want to change um, uh, the, the, the substances that might be allowed in terms of toxicity in a children's toy or the electrical systems in a car to make sure they don't interfere with pacemakers as soon as you change the nutritional information on food packaging to decide that it actually has to contain this kind of information something important happens you now have to stand on the border and check the goods that are coming in because if you are going to maintain some kind of regulatory consistency if you're going to be able to pass laws about the way that your economy and your society looks, you have to make sure that stuff coming in from outside abides by those rules. The answer to this, in European terms, is the single market. And the single market is arguably the most radical and impressive feat of cooperation across international borders in the history of mankind. It unifies regulation. And it does this in a few ways. One of them is it sets up institutions like the European Court of Justice, which rules on the same laws that are being passed in certain areas by the same states. Another way is it says, OK, fine, if we don't cover it in this area over here, we would assume that what's good enough for us is good enough for you. Now, the key to this is something called, um, there's a dreadful French liqueur, which every French friend I have tells me reliably is great, and I completely disagree. And it's called um, creme de cassis. Uh, it's a fruit-based liqueur. Germany had a rule with this. It said, we don't take any kind of liqueur with fruit content by a certain alcohol percentage. Now, under the EU, under this idea of what's good enough for me is good enough for you, they don't get to do that. You have to take it anyway. Now, this does not apply everywhere. There are some areas where those rules aren't there, but kind of one of the annoying things about talking about the EU is you can barely say anything about it without having to then go, but also the opposite is true, and blah, 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 blah. Because that's what it's like when you have a massive continent-wide cooperation program over a series of decades. It's complicated. Nevertheless, that is the basic thesis upon which this takes place. You facilitate trade, you make life better for everyone by making it as easy as possible to pass goods around in terms of tariffs, but also in terms of the regulation that you have. So there is a reason why I'm, um, is this mine? Okay. <laughs> so there's a reason why the take-back control argument really struggles when it comes up against these kind of organisations. <laughs> <laughs> this is in danger of a visual joke. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. That is not going to happen. Right. Um, there's a reason that this sort of stuff runs up against the kind of problem, and the, the problem is the reality of the way the trade operates. You take something like the customs union, it's okay to say we can leave this group in order to get more trade elsewhere. But in actual fact, distance exists. <laughs> and it is a problem to the manner in which you trade. Now, it's very obviously a problem with, with goods. Uh, I was talking to a guy the other day, weirdly enough, it's Al Murray, the pub landlord, who also has a drum business, of all things. 
Um, and he sends John those. And I can imagine what a drum is. Like, it is a quite expensive item, which is basically just an encasement of air. It takes up a huge amount of space. If you want to put that thing on a boat and send it somewhere, that costs a bunch of money. So it tends to be that we trade with people who are closest to us. We thought this would start to die down. We thought after a while that actually it would change because of services and because of the internet. With the world of, if you're, if you're doing interior design, maybe someone can just take a photo of the house, you know, and then they just send it to the guy on a file, and you can recommend what you do, blah, blah, blah. But actually, even with services, it doesn't really change. It pretty much stays the same. People have tastes that are to do with the area that they're in. They have language requirements. Even if it's something like management consultancy or something, you typically need to be in the space in which you're going to do it. Distance matters. The EU is our largest market. There is no way of putting up a drawbridge there, opening up um, as many sort of you know, opportunities as you can elsewhere and thinking that that's going to work out for you economically. It will not. But even without that, you also lose the ability to really have that heft of a market behind you that can make things function for you, having those numbers of consumers to prize open places like America in a way it works, but admittedly the EU did fare at that, to prize open places like Japan. Much, much harder when you're a smaller entity than it is when you're a larger entity. And on services, the differences are probably even more stark for a country like Britain. So take something like aviation. Uh, which is a classic service and a service that has functioned very, very well in the way that Britain works. Aviation tends to work by bilateral treaties, and it's worked that way basically since the end of the Second World War. You would have one country that sign a deal with the other one, it says we've got the following aviation rights with you. We're allowed to fly over to yours, we can make a stop over in another country, we get to fly back. And that is actually quite restrictive in terms of the way that you do things. When you go into a single market aviation, there is an entirely different way of doing it. And that is to say the following. You can fly as a European operator from any point in Europe to any other point. Your relationship with the country that you come from is of no consequence whatsoever. You do not have to have any stoppage going on in Britain at any stage if you're a British carrier. You can be flying from one French city to another French city. This has worked very, very well for Britain. It is meant that Britain is the leader in aviation, certainly in Europe, and almost in the world. It also means and the only manner in which it can be achieved is by sharing regulation, sharing the agencies that make a judgment on regulation, and sharing ways of doing things. The way that we do that in aviation is through something called EASA, which is under the European Air Safety Authority. Britain and France together found two thirds of the regulations that go through in EASA. Now, this thing vouches for everything. It vouches for the little trolley that goes up and down the aisle with the drinks and the food, it vouches for the wheels, it vouches for the brakes, it vouches for the engine. And in there, you have countries like Britain making the case for the regulation, sharing the regulation at a continental level. When you get rid of this stuff, if you decide to put out of it, you will find that your trade is very, very significantly negatively affected. So it should be no surprise to see that Theresa May's, one of Theresa May's overtures very, very early on was, please, please let us stay in this thing. Something that we're not entirely sure the Europeans will be tolerant of. Even if you get away from this kind of issue, how we know? Um, even if you get away from this kind of issue, you still have to make compromises when it comes to your free trade agreements with other countries. If you make a free trade agreement with India, they are going to ask you for a facilitation of immigration to this country. If you make a free trade agreement with China, they are going to ask you for more of a foothold in your energy market. If you make a free trade agreement with America, they're going to ask you to facilitate the ability for them to send agricultural goods into your country. These kind of quick pro quotes are part of how we do anything, even in the single market. That is always there. You give up a bit of control, you get mutual gain. The difference is when we talk about this stuff in the single market, it is done transparently. It is done in full view. It is done in front of TV cameras. People vote on it. The legislation is published. You may have noticed throughout the Brexit process, the EU has been actually very transparent. It is not a naturally transparent organisation, but it is finding its way, mostly as the European Parliament tries to force the Commission to behave in a rather better way, has been much more transparent than the British government has been. So when you consider for a moment what would be involved in a US 
for an agreement, we all know about the coronated chicken and how many injected beef and the blah blah blah. Not least the way that the Americans would feel about NICE, which is the organisation within the NHS which assesses the efficiency of drugs versus their cost, something which US pharmaceutical companies would like to kill and murder in a back alley as soon as humanly possible. You would see that the British government would do this very, very quietly, away from the cameras as much as it can. Those concessions on cooperation and mutual advantage will typically be done away from the public eye, would not give any clear sense of the public taking back control. The only real way, once I get past the economics, that the Brexit argument holds strong is, I'm told, through immigration. Now, um, there is a truth about immigration that nobody likes to mention in this country. I don't think the person who's happening just now is going to be particularly happy about it. Um, it is that this country benefits from immigration to a tremendous extent. <laughs> Um, it benefits economically for very, very simple reasons, which is and not a particularly palatable one to talk about, but one you kind of have to do anyway, which is basically that we have too many old people. Uh, a human life operates in the following way. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, uh, The human life operates in the following way. In the very early stages, you cost the state money. You cost the state money through healthcare, you cost the money through education. And at the end of the human life, you cost the state money again. You do it through your pensions and you do it through healthcare. Um, in the middle, your working age, is supposed to be the point where you pay that money back for your childhood and you put the advance on what happens to you later on. <clears throat> it's a bit simplified what I've just said, but the broad outline is, is pretty much how it works. Um, we have a significant demographic problem with too many old people in the country, not of people of working age to pay the taxes that are required to look after them. One of the solutions to this, and it is not a whole solution, it is really only something that buys you time until you can do something to improve the situation in a more substantive, long-term way, is immigration. Is people of working age coming to this country so they can look after and care for the older people who will then leave the retirement home to vote for Brexit to say that they should have to leave the country? <laughs> <laughs> there is a signal on case for Brexit and you can see it in the data. Because if you look at the number of people who are coming on the freedom of movement rules, it is the same amount that we're coming on the non-freedom of movement rules. Yes. When you take the argument of take back control, the reality is the only kind of control you need over immigration is for there to be jobs or not in your society. When you see an economic downturn, there are fewer jobs and fewer immigrants come. When you see more jobs, more people come. This will not baffle anyone who knows immigrants, because immigrants go, I didn't come here for the weather. I came here because there was a job. And I thought that there would be a society that would treat me fairly and treat me decently. And on the back of that, I might be treated with some dignity and I could make some money and I can improve my state. There is a control already for immigration, simply by supply and demand. And we demonstrate it ourselves by the manner in which we let in as many people where we can control it as we do where we do not control it. But even that argument I've started to find a little bit tiresome and irritating, I'd say, even though I've been making myself for the last two years, which is that I do not hear enough of people trying to say that immigration isn't just good for this country economically, but has made this country culturally rich. And that that is... And that, that is a pleasure in and of itself. Now, I don't just mean it for food, but I really do mean it for food. <laughs> I also mean it, of course, for the things that we see in film and in music that immigrants bring to this country, but also something kind of that feels more kind of philosophical, which is ultimately when you see diverse groups of people working together you see them come to unexpected solutions to problems. <coughs> it cannot be a coincidence that each time we see more immigration into a sector of the economy, we see an improvement in the productivity in that sector of the economy. Now, of course, if it, productivity, of course, the main problem that we face in the British economy, it 
can't just be the old thing of saying, well, you know, immigrants just work hard. I think it's something more than that. It's that people bring, yes, new clients, but they also bring things like new ways of working, new ideas, new experiences. And when you put those things together, you get very exciting, unpredictable results. You get very exciting and unpredictable societies, like the kind of society that this has been growing into over the last few years. And that I think we saw, to be honest, for a brief glimmer during the Olympics and then faded away in the monstrous reactionary horror that we've seen in the years that have followed it. This stuff on immigration, I'm not going to I think I'm done. Okay, just give me two more minutes. This stuff on immigration you can see all over the place, and it is part of a reactionary attack on the idea of movement, not just of people, but also realistically of trade, of ideas, of goods, of services, about this being a world where you gain more through diversity than you do through the opposite. We see it with Orban in Hungary, in naked anti-Semitism. We see it um, through Erdogan in Turkey. We've seen it this week with Five Star and the League, a bunch of fascist thugs taking over Italy. We see it with Trump, who, by the way, is not content with the kind of language that he has used, but is now attacking the WTO. The organization that we are told is the acceptable alternative to the EU is having its open court kneecapped by Trump's refusal to engage, so it cannot come to any judgments. Any international institution is under attack by reactionary forces. They constantly talk about taking back control. I would suggest there is no control to be found there whatsoever. There is only the mutual disadvantage that comes when you fail to work together in a sensible and open-minded way. And for that reason, as must be rather obvious by now, I don't think the Brexit is worth it. <laughs>